I try to imagine a fellow smarter than myself, and then I try to think, what would he do? Charge up your axons, ready your receptors, and shift your lobes into upper beta phase. You are listening to Smart Drug Smarts, the podcast dedicated to helping you optimize your brain with the latest breakthroughs in neuroscience, nootropics, and psychopharmacology. Hello and welcome to Smart Drug Smarts. I'm your host, Jesse Lawler, excited to bring you the 150th episode of this podcast dedicated to the ongoing betterment of your brain by any and all means at your disposal. This week, we're going to be bringing back a Smart Drug Smarts alumnus, Dr. Mark Matson from the National Institute of Health. We talked with him previously about intermittent fasting, and this time we're also going to be talking about an offshoot of the human diet, particularly the role of plant toxins. When we hear the word toxin, all sorts of red flags go up as they should, but there's actually some counterintuitive and not always negative findings as far as the effects of plant toxins on our physiology and on our brains in particular, and we'll be talking with Dr. Matson about that in the main interview. If you hang around until the very end of the episode, I know that a lot of you listening are concerned with getting as much done with your time as possible and trying to be super efficient little human beings and productive and not just efficient, but effective. And of course, a necessary ingredient in all that is being able to properly rest and recharge. In the Ruthless Listener Retention gimmick, we'll be talking about some of the best science-backed ways to make sure that when you think you're resting, you actually are resting. So hang around for that at the end. But right now, let's jump in with This Week in Neuroscience. Smart Drug Smarts, This Week in Neuroscience. Okay, so this one is fascinating if you are a dog lover, dog owner, or even dog familiar. A lot of people's standard assumption, and I remember doing this when, when me and my sister were kids, where you'll talk to a dog and use words in a tone that doesn't match. Like you'll say, oh, you're such a bad dog. You're a terrible dog. And, you know, confuse the dog. And of course, the response that you get from the dog is it seems like the dog is responding to your tone and your physicality, not to the actual words. But then every now and then there's these weird hints that dogs actually do understand the semantic meaning of words. Like my mom's dog definitely does know the word walk. Somebody says walk and the dog's ears will prick up and it'll start prancing around and go looking for the leash. And and it could be a pain when you're talking about walk in a context that has nothing to do with the dog, but all of a sudden the dog is chomping at the bit. And so my mom, just like how parents will sometimes spell words so you can use bad words in front of a three-year-old, my mom would say W-A-L-K instead of the word walk when the dog was around and when she was talking about taking the dog for a walk later, but she wasn't ready to do so right now and she didn't want to pre-hype up the dog. So that's the question. Do dogs understand the meaning of words as separate and distinct from the tones. And to answer this question, they actually put specially trained dogs into fMRI machines. So they're studying the blood flow of dogs' brains as they're exposed to various cues. In this case, this was actually a study conducted in Budapest, so the words were all Hungarian, but the dogs were exposed to equally prevalent words. So words that would come up in conversation about the same amount, so the dogs would have similar levels of familiarity with them. But some words the dogs would have reasons to think of positively, things like food or walk, and others were more neutral words. And it turns out that the answer is both both. The fMRI scan showed that words of praise provoked strong activations in the dog's left hemispheres, irrespective of the tone that the words were presented in. So if you said, oh, you're such a good dog, or you're such a good dog, both of those phrases would cause responses in the left half of the dog's brain. But the intonation, that was the province of the right hemisphere. And that side of the brain got all excited by emotional deliveries of words, regardless of the actual word content. So while nobody's going to make a dog a sign language interpreter or something like that just yet, it's pretty interesting that they actually do have the capacity to, to some extent, know the meaning of words in addition to the tone that people are trying to express to them. What the tone seems to do, and this is pretty much the same as with humans, is it provides a cue for the probable semantic information that will be expressed in the words. So if you're talking in your snuggly, wuggly teddy bear voice, you're kind of priming the dog to expect something positive to be there in the semantic information, which makes you wonder if at some small level, a dog has a sense of sarcasm when they recognize a mismatch between the emotional presentation and the semantic content of what's being said to them, because that's really just what sarcasm is. When you say something like, God, That's just great which the words are objectively positive, but the tone is obviously negative. So a lot of similarities between the way that human and dog brains process speech, which raises the interesting question, is this something which is common across mammals? Or because dogs have been co-evolving with humans for the last 35,000 years, has there been a selection pressure for dogs that interpret speech in a way that closely approximates humans? To answer that question, I think they would have to get some wolves or dingoes into an fMRI after exposing them to human language for a long time. And, And that's a study that probably won't be done anytime soon. Smart Drug Smarts, the podcast so smart, we have smart in our title, twice. Picked up a five-star review from listener Chris Treborn in Sweden, who said, Currently suffering from burnout fatigue from overworking. This podcast is not only entertaining, it has really helped me a lot in getting better, improving my sleep, practicing gratitude, etc. Thanks, and keep the content flowing. Well, thank you, I certainly shall. 
Thanks also to those of you that wrote in with Halloween episode suggestions. I've been banging that gong for about the last month here, and I think we finally got something sort of settled on, which is a very worthy episode topic. Long time coming, and we could probably tie back to Halloween reasonably well. A big thanks also to those of you who have been shopping over at Axon Labs. We've got our sibling site on the internet over at axonlabs.io. You can also get over there by clicking on the shop link on the Smart Drug Smarts homepage. But Axon Labs is where we have Nexus and Mitogen, our cognitive and mitochondrial health stacks. I kind of feel like mitochondrial health gets a bit of a short shrift when we talk about it, since physiologically it's painting with a much more broad brush. It's not necessarily brain specific, but I remain a big fan of Mitogen. Today is actually one of the rare days I've got neither Nexus nor Mitogen in my system, no caffeine, no anything. Every now and then I'll do a day or two of full washout, just take no supplements, no anything. But in keeping with the spirit of hormesis, which we'll be talking about later on in this episode, I think there's a lot to be said for keeping your body guessing a little bit and your brain, not giving it the same inputs day in, day out, but building up some of that resilience that comes from not knowing exactly what's coming next. Before the weekend's out, no doubt I will have returned to my nexus and mitogen pill-popping ways, but should you want to beat me to the punch, you can find both of those on the web at axonlabs.io. Smart Drug Smarts. So as mentioned, we're going to be speaking with Dr. Mark Matson from the National Institute on Aging, which is a division of the National Institute of Health. Dr. Matson is the chief of the Laboratory of Neurosciences at the National Institute on Aging Intramural Research Program, and he is also a professor of neuroscience at Johns Hopkins University. And we actually first spoke with him back 30 episodes ago on episode number 120, talking about intermittent fasting, which is both a study subject and a personal avocation for Dr. Matson. And then here's how this episode came together. Several weeks ago, we reached out to Dr. Matson with a a little favor that we were asking, basically something that we wanted to get done on Twitter. And Dr. Matson very politely deflected. He didn't want to do that favor, but he said, tell you what, I've got a bunch of new research I've been doing and I'd love to talk with you about that. So this is like one of these situations where you ask somebody to bum $5 and they give you $100 instead. We were very, very happy to get him back on. And what you're about to hear is a fairly wide ranging discussion. We're not focusing on any particular plant, but the general idea that plant toxins are not necessarily all they're cracked up to be as far as inherently negative things and that a lot of the benefits that we derive are in some ways our body's response to these plants defense mechanisms. One word that comes up a few times in this conversation, and the concept is probably something that we're dancing around continuously, is that of hormesis. We actually had a full episode on hormesis. That was episode number 108 with Dr. Edward Calabrese. Definitely worth bumping back to that one and checking it out if you haven't already. But the elevator pitch for hormesis goes something like this. There are a lot of potential inputs to our body, and this could be the input of a compound, like something that we eat or drink, or something that we do, like a physical exercise, that whether they wind up having good or bad outcomes for us is very much dose dependent. A small amount of something could be very, very good. A large amount could be exceedingly dangerous. In the case of exercise, you taking a couple laps around the block is probably a good thing. Walking until you collapse unconscious is probably a terrible idea. And hormesis is a topic with very, very wide potential applications. But no more preamble. Let's jump in with Dr. Mark Matson. I've always been fascinated by the number of chemicals that plants produce and contain in their cells compared to animals. And just reading through the literature on plant evolution, it became clear that a large number of the chemicals that plants produce function to dissuade insects and other organisms from eating the plant or eating too much of the plant. And also it turns out that, for example, fruits, as fruits develop, when they're immature, they often taste very bitter. And then as they mature and become ripe and, and the seeds then are fully formed, whatever's giving these fruits their bitter taste, our vegetables, their bitter taste is reduced. And it turns out that many of these chemicals, they're regulated in a manner that they allow the fruit or vegetable to mature enough to be able to have its seeds dispersed. And then, of course, we and other herbivores or omnivores disperse seeds. And then in looking at the literature, we, we had a lot of interest in adaptive stress response signaling pathways in neurons, as you know. Uh, that is to say, we want to understand how cells respond adaptively to stress whether it's a metabolic stress like exercise or fasting or uh, some noxious chemical. And it turns out that there's actually quite a big literature showing that some of the chemicals you find in health food stores, for example, curcumin, sulforaphane, and there's resveratrol, other examples. These chemicals, if you apply them to cells and culture, uh, the cells will respond by upregulating gene expression programs that help the cells cope with and resist stress and, and these are stress response pathways. So we know that if we directly apply these chemicals, which there's now quite a bit of evidence, can have some health benefits. 
to cells, they induce stress in the cells at certain concentrations. In fact, if we take the most commonly consumed phytochemical, that is chemical produced in plants, which is caffeine, caffeine is a toxin at high concentrations. There's been documented cases of people dying from essentially overdosing on caffeine. So caffeine comes from plants and its function in the plant is not to stimulate us so that we're more alert. Right. It, its function is to keep insects and us from eating the plant. If you take caffeine, pure caffeine, and put on your tongue, it has a very bitter taste. You would not want to eat pure caffeine. And the same is true with many of these other plant chemicals that seem to have health benefits. If you take the pure chemical and you put it on your tongue, you know, it interacts with your taste buds, has very bitter tastes. We can also think about day-to-day -day experience. You know, children, it's often hard to get them to eat healthy vegetables and fruits. And part of that is because they have a bitter taste. It's really interesting what you said about the life cycle, how as a plant matures to a certain point, a lot of the negative taste effects sort of drop away. Yeah, we're doing a study now, uh, me and colleagues here at NIA, with a chemical from green tomatoes. It's called tomatidine. Mm -hmm. And we're finding that tomatidine has many beneficial effects in, in organisms ranging from worms to mice. And that's what we've looked at and within certain concentration range. So this is an idea of hormesis, which we talked about previously when we talked about intermittent fasting. And I'm sure your listeners have been exposed to this notion that things whether it's exercise or fasting or low doses of naturally occurring toxins can have beneficial effects. Yeah. And so we find with this chemical in green tomatoes, that's also true within a certain concentration range. It will increase the lifespan of worms and has uh, neuroprotective effects in some of our animal models. And then, interestingly, this tomatidine is present at high levels in the green tomatoes, but then almost disappears in red ripe tomatoes. The idea here is, from an evolutionary perspective, herbivores, including humans who eat a lot of plants, and our non-human primate ancestors who lived in the canopy in mainly tropical forests, they consumed a lot of plants, and it was to their advantage to be able to tolerate the consumption of these bitter tasting and potentially toxic chemicals. So we've evolved multiple mechanisms to prevent us from overdosing. The ways that we've evolved to protect ourselves from overdosing is, first is the taste buds. The first nerve cells that are exposed to the chemical when we eat them. You know, so if it has a very bitter taste, we don't want to eat very much. The second mechanism is vomiting. Some of these chemicals, including some of the chemicals that may be good for our health in high doses, they will cause us to vomit or have nausea. Yeah. The third mechanism that we've evolved to prevent overdosing is the evolution of enzymes mainly in the liver, that detoxify, that metabolize these naturally occurring chemicals and eliminate them from our body very rapidly. So if you eat broccoli, for example, particularly broccoli, have high levels of sulforaphane, it stays in our system only a short period of time, minutes to a few hours, and then it's cleared out. These naturally occurring plant chemicals do not accumulate over time in our cells because they're rapidly metabolized and, and we pee them out, essentially. It's impossible to talk about smelly chemical pee and not mention asparagus. One of the things that's always impressed me with asparagus, just how quickly after eating it, you can actually smell the, the byproducts, the residues of those chemicals in your pee. I always kind of thought intuitively it took a while for food to get processed and, and come out downstream, but asparagus seems to be proof that it's actually a pretty fast process. Yeah, in my understanding, Standing kind of educated guess is that what you're smelling is a metabolite of asparagus it's gone through the liver and these enzymes conjugate or hook these phytochemicals to another molecule that then targets them for elimination in the urine when they pass through the kidney. Because the body seems like it is especially aggressive in clearing out at least a part of the, the asparagus plant from your system, should that be a cause for concern? I mean, is there something in there that our bodies like get this out of here as fast as humanly possible? Fortunately, that has been largely taken care of through millions of years of evolution. That's kind of my point here. Yeah. Insect antifeedant. So this book is a thousand pages. Each page shows a chemical that's been isolated from a plant, and that chemical has been shown 
shown to have noxious effects on insects. So there was a whole industry that was aimed at isolating chemicals from plants and then determining which ones and you know what concentrations have noxious effects on insects with the goal of, of manufacturing large amounts of these chemicals to use as pesticides. Yeah. Now, the last step is where the problem comes in, in manufacturing large amounts of these chemicals. So then what people did was make man-made pesticides. The classic example is DDT. Yeah. And this is a chemical that we haven't been exposed to. And therefore, we, we have no enzymes to remove them quickly from our system. And it accumulates over time. And that is why DDT is bad news, because even relatively low exposures over time result in the accumulation of large amounts of this chemical because our bodies can't eliminate it. In contrast to these naturally occurring chemicals that we can rapidly eliminate. You know what strikes me hearing you talk about these chemicals, which are essentially natural insecticides, is that humans have such a longer life cycle, you know, 25 years about is the length of a human generation versus insects that breed so much more quickly. How come we've been able to come up with a workaround for these toxic chemicals and insects, despite the fact that there's going to be strong selection pressures on them and a much quicker generational cycle? They haven't been. Now, this is a good question. Um, as with us, the, the first cells that encounter these chemicals in insects are cells having to do with taste or or molecule perception. There's these nerve cells called sensilla that insects uh, can detect very low concentrations of, of these chemicals that are potentially toxic. Uh, but one fact is that in contrast to us who have these hundreds, even thousand or more liver enzymes that can break down various chemicals, the insects don't have that array of these enzymes. And so what the insects do is they they find plants or regions of plants, a lot of times fruit, or in the case of pollinators, nectar. So they're able to live on parts of the plant or sources of energy produced by the plants without having to consume the noxious parts. Uh, and, and it's the same, you know, we talked about ripening of fruits. Again, the insects are probably better off from an energy standpoint waiting until the fruits are ripe to eat them. As you know, as, as fruits ripen the, their sugar content, which in uh, many fruits is mainly fructose, the concentration of fructose and therefore the calorie content increases as the fruits mature. So probably there's some adaptive value in actually not eating the immature fruits because that would essentially block the ability of the plant to reproduce, you know, produce seeds and reproduce produce. And then if that source of food dies out in the long run, that's not good for the insect. This is probably less a biochemistry question, more like a um, ecology question, I guess. But sugar in fruit, is that essentially free energy that a plant is putting out? A plant can never reclaim that energy. It's not like a fat storage in a human or something. It's essentially a plant giving away that energy to the ecosystem in order to induce predation. That's right. The, the plant does not use that energy. As you know, that energy ultimately comes initially from the sun, yeah. right? And carbon in the air in the form of CO2 being taken up by plants. Uh, the CO2, the carbon in the CO2 is then used to produce sugar, hydrocarbons. Then we eat the plants. And we get the energy from the plants. And then we breathe out CO2 or uh, methane on the other end of the, the digestive. And this kind of recycles the carbon, you know, and, and then, as you know, photosynthesis requires the energy from the sun. Yeah, so this whole cycle is really fascinating from an energy standpoint. Turning back to humans and how we can use this to our advantage, what can we draw from this other than things that mothers and grandmothers have been telling us since, you know, time immemorial to, you know, eat your vegetables when they're put in front of you? This comes down to what one of the fourth protective mechanism that I have not I talked about, which is from my standpoint in our own research, and, and maybe from the standpoint of developing preventative approach and interventions for particularly chronic disorders of aging, is that our cells respond adaptively to these chemicals. All the cells throughout the body, as far as we know, and including brain cells, nerve cells in our brain, many of these chemicals, sulforaphane, curcumin, caffeine is an excellent example, get into our, even into our brain, and they induce mild stress on our nerve cells. However, this is a good stress. In the case of caffeine, our brain functions better for our neurons 
having experienced exposure to caffeine. So the fourth line of defense, which we've actually used to our advantage, is the evolution of adaptive responses in cells that strengthen the cells, make them more able to resist oxidative stress, free radical, better able to re resist metabolic stress, that is, the stress imposed by the activity of the nerve cells or muscle cells through exercise or fasting, for example. Let me talk about some specific pathways, which I think are really interesting, and I'm gonna focus on nerve cells in the brain. So I'll start with caffeine. It turns out that caffeine elicits at least some very similar effects on nerve cells as does exercise and as does engaging in intellectually challenging activities like you and I are doing now, that is exercising our nerve cells. Yeah. And the pathway involves a transcription factor called CREB or CREB. CREB plays a critical role in learning and memory because it stimulates genes that encode proteins that are critical for the formation and growth of synapses, the nerve connections between our nerve cells. So there's a huge literature showing that exercise particularly intermittent vigorous exercise can improve learning and memory, can improve mood. And this CREB protein is essential for those effects of exercise. It's also essential for basic learning and memory. So CREB is one very important protein that mediates beneficial effects on our brain of at least one. And actually, we, there's some other phytochemicals that we're discovering activate CREB as well. Another protein that is affected by some of these naturally occurring toxins or naturally occurring pesticides is a protein called NRF2. Nuclear Regulatory Factor 2. NRF2 is activated by sulforaphane, which is present in high levels in broccoli. It's also activated by curcumin, which is a popular food supplement. And actually, there's a huge literature on curcumin activating these stress responses in cells. In the past, I've been a runner and actually an avid trail runner. I've had to quit doing that recently because uh, as with many people who are getting into their 60s or older, they develop osteoarthritis. And the knee seems to be particularly prone to osteoarthritis. And this is an inflammatory inflammatory disorder where there's inflammation of the joint as a result of age and wear and tear. But, but anyway, turns out curcumin, which is in turmeric, it has an anti-inflammatory effect. And the reason it does is that it's sort of counterintuitively, but this is the fact, the reason it is good for inflammation because it induces a mild oxidative stress in cells in the joint. And this oxidative stress activates this NRF2 pathway and increases the production of antioxidant enzymes. At least a half a dozen different natural proteins in our cells that get rid of free radicals. So one way in which these naturally occurring chemicals that we consume in fruits or vegetables or spices benefit our cells is by stimulating production of antioxidants and enzymes. And we find that's true in neurons too. Sulforaphane or curcumin will beef up the ability of the cells to resist oxidative stress. I had one question as far as overall diet. There's some dietary protocols talk about wanting to do like a mono meal, the benefits of having a meal that really is, is primarily only one food. And, and I could kind of see where in the context of what you're talking about here, where that might kind of make sense if the first few mouthfuls of something let your body know, hey, we're getting this stress response inducing chemical coming down the pike. There's probably going to be more of it in the next few minutes, kind of like prepping the gastroenterological system to expect more of the same rather than maybe eating, you know, 16 different ingredients together that might be pulling your body in different directions as far as the correct response. Do you have any thoughts on that? Oh, that, that's a fascinating idea. And to tell you the truth, I hadn't really thought about this much at all until now. It makes a lot of sense. Chemicals that are in a lot of these plants will improve our ability of cells, including gut cells and other cells, to resist oxidative stress. And it turns out one of the main things that increases oxidative stress when we eat a meal is the components of the meal that have calories that can be used for energy production. Glucose is the prime example when glucose actually promotes oxidative stress. And if you eat a meal and just measure in the blood what we call markers of oxidative stress, after eating a meal, 
meal with a high calorie content, markers of oxidative stress go up. To my knowledge, there's not been a study, although I've, there could be that I don't know about, where scientists have taken subjects and you know had them consume whatever, turmeric root or broccoli or just give them the chemicals themselves that we know induce these adaptive stress responses and then then wait uh, some time period. We'd have to figure out what's the best, but you know, wait a half hour, wait an hour until some of these antioxidant offenses are upregulated in the cells, then taking the food with high calories. The hypothesis essentially, which I'm hearing from you first, but apparently maybe other people have thought about this, these would be really good studies to do, and they could be done. Very straightforward studies to do. Another question that occurred to me, you know, we, we've talked a lot about caffeine and caffeine is one of these things like I have no idea actually what the fruit of the coffee plant actually is. It's, it's interesting. We're so familiar with the beans, but how come it is you think that some of these things that we, we do have a lot of familiarity with, the fruit has never actually made its way onto our plates? Because it has a very bitter taste. Bananas is a good example. It, there's research, I think it's mostly in the cancer field, but scientists have isolated chemicals from the skin of bananas that have these kind of noxious effects. They're finding it relatively high doses can kill cancer cells, whereas these chemicals are not in the in what we eat, the meat part of the banana. And even in apples, and we can tolerate these bitter chemicals, but they're mainly in the peel. Right. If you just take the peel off and eat the peel you know, with as little amount of the meat part of the fruit as you can, it has kind of a bitter taste. But when we take a bite of an apple, we're kind of mixing a lot of non-bitter meat part with a little bit of the bitter part. And it's the, the chemicals in the skin of the apple that the geneticists, through either crossbreeding or now there's even you know making GMO apples, I think, they're controlling the mixture of chemicals in the skin, you know, trying to mix chemicals that may have more of a pleasant taste with those existing ones that have a bitter taste. That's interesting. I was I was always one of those kids that would eat the meat of the apple and leave the rind sitting on the plate. I hope you've changed your ways. Well, I, I, I know now that that's probably not the, <laughs> the best way to go. And after this uh, this interview, now everybody else will know. Same thing with, with oranges, right? Nobody eats the peels. You know, we used to take the peel and like squirt it in the eye of our friend. Did you ever do that? Yeah, I, I think probably more my, my pseudo enemies than friends. Friends don't last long when they get orange juice in their eye. Yeah. Yeah, it kind of stings. But if you if you squirt it on your tongue, you know, instead of your friend's eye, it's also kind of stings a little bit. So nicotine also is another one of these chemicals that is a uh, deadly to insects. Although the tobacco plant isn't something that we think of as a food plant. No, that's really interesting. There are. I was at University of Kentucky in Lexington for eleven years. I was a professor there, and it's a big tobacco state. You just drive through the countryside, tobacco fields, and then they hang the tobacco to dry up and turn brown in the, the barns. But there are certain insects eat the tobacco leaves. So there, there are certain species of insects that evolve the ability to tolerate high levels of nicotine. Then another aspect from the neuroscience perspective, of course, with nicotine is addiction. Yeah. Is there an evolutionary basis for addiction to nicotine? I haven't really thought about that, but it raised kind of an interesting question of whether during human evolution, there might have been some advantage of going back to a nicotine source of food. You know, is there some adaptive value? I don't I don't know, but... I, I just did probably about a month ago an interview with Dr. Neil Grunberg, one of the experts on nicotine. It's a fascinating compound. We think of it in the context of tobacco, but it's kind of like if you just suck out nicotine and look at it as a chemical in the absence of cigarette smoking, there's actually a lot to be said for it. You know, ultimately it's affecting dopaminergic pathways, but it's nicotine acts on a, acetylcholine receptors. And these receptors are in, in taste buds, but also in number of circuits in our brain. It turns out that activation of these so-called nicotinic receptors the receptors activated by nicotine and nerve cells in our brain will lead to activation of CREP. Now we're, we're, we're kind of, I enjoy these kind of freewheeling, we start to think of things that we haven't thought of before. So I mentioned exercise will upregulate CREB. Maybe in a good way for the most part, exercise can be addictive. You know, it's only recently I started trail running and I kind of had a withdrawal symptoms, right? When I quit exercising actually for three weeks, I started to have withdrawal symptoms and my mood got worse. And there may be some links at the level of the nerve cell circuits and their signaling pathways in, and the circuits in involved in addiction 
See, addiction, you, you can imagine from an evolutionary perspective, addiction to certain things could have a beneficial effect. Addiction to exercise could be good. Evolution probably selected for individuals who are physically fit, and being physically fit necessitates frequent exercise, whether it's a predator chasing prey or so on, but also maybe the exercise of running a long distance to a food source. Yeah, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but the runner's high comes from endogenous opioids, which it would make sense that your body would want you to be addicted to those. And that that's probably sort of the spillover effect is that when we find exogenous opioids in the environment, we can get addicted to those things as well. But the, the purpose of your body's response isn't to addict you to heroin, it's to addict you to jogging. We also know now that there are in your brain endogenous cannabinoids, that is, chemicals that have the exact same effect of smoking or eating marijuana. These chemicals in our brain activate the same pathways as when we take exogenous marijuana. And there is some evidence that exercise will increase the production and activity of these endogenous cannabinoids. So this could be part of the reason that that exercise improves mood and, and makes you sort of mellow if you will. Right. So each year, the NIH has a relay race. The National Institutes of Health is very big. There's over 16,000 employees. So they, they started this relay race about, about 33 years ago down in Bethesda. It's, each team has five runners, two have to be female. The distance of each leg is a little over 800 meters, 850 meters. It's on a course that has a hill in it, so it's not flat. And so what I've done is had together groups of runners here and I I coached them, and uh, this year we set the course record All right. actually by a lot. And it's 110 teams, so we won, and we're actually more than a minute ahead of any other team. The NIH has a program for kids after they get their bachelor's degree. They can spend a year or two doing research mm -hmm. at a lab at NIH. So when I go into the, the database for these kids who apply for this post back fellow research program at NIH, I search for neuroscience, people interested in neuroscience, but I kind of also put in there the key words cross country track and so I've recruited some kids who they're very good academically but they also just happen to be a uh, really good on track and cross country and, and also I know from our own science that these kids their brains are going to work well last time I talked about BDNF I think this neurotrophic factor that's upregulated so I know there's actually a scientific basis why their brains may be working better than than their peers who don't exercise I was just going to ask with that many people in the NIH, what is the average level of health of NIH workers versus American society in general? I mean, do you see any uh, trends or disparities? I imagine you don't have too many cigarette smokers. I don't think we've done, anyone's done statistics on it, but my impression, well, it's a very clear impression. If you walk around the NIH campus, you will see fewer obese people than you will see, you know, walking around any city in the country. They're much more health conscious. In fact, there's a, an initiative, a government initiative that started, I can't remember remember how many year, years ago it's called healthy feds to try to get government employees to have good you know, diet and lifestyle practices and then the question comes up can we take these supplements can we consume low levels of these naturally occurring toxins and mimic some of the effects of exercise or fasting and my answer to that is uh Partially. <laughs> yeah. Since we evolved, obtaining food was a driving force for evolution, competing for food. The key things there are the, the exercise and fasting activate multiple beneficial signaling pathways, whereas these phytochemicals, each individual chemical may activate only one pathway. So, you know, there's been a lot of interest in the notion that, that one may accrue more health benefits from eating fruits and vegetables than from consuming just one chemical that's in those fruits and vegetables. And it could be that, in part, the reason is that each fruit or vegetable has multiple semi-noxious stress-inducing chemicals that each of those chemicals activates a different adaptive stress pathway in, neuro in cells. So, for example, Sulforaphane may be really good at increasing antioxidant enzymes in our cells, whereas caffeine may be particularly good at activating Krebs and promoting growth and what we call plasticity of cells, in the case of neurons, formation of new synapses. And so that when you consume these chemicals in combination through multiple mechanisms, the cells benefit. Selenium is a really good example. Selenium is a metal. It's in like Brazil nuts and some things like that, right? Yeah. Selenium, its first biological effect on animals and cells was that it, it's toxic. 
high levels of selenium are toxic. And then people did research where they fed animals selenium deficient diets. And it turns out you have to have some selenium for optimal health. So organisms evolved in the presence of different amounts of selenium. And my assumption is that organisms not only develop the ability to resist the toxic effects of selenium, but they develop the ability to incorporate selenium, for example, into certain antioxidant enzymes that promote health. Yeah. And, and so then if an organism's living in a level with high selenium, the ones that survive would be the ones that are able to have some mutation that enables them to tolerate the selenium. And then that was passed on. To a certain extent, it's a Goldilocks zone where you want an amount greater than zero and less than a toxic dose. But it could actually be a pretty wide Goldilocks zone where any individual organism can kind of adapt to the level that might be frequent in the environment. That's right. Exactly. I'm wondering about kids, for example. When I was a kid, I didn't like broccoli. Now that I'm an adult, I love broccoli. Like literally could eat a, a plateful of broccoli and not think twice about it. Even raw broccoli? Uh, that, that's true. That's true. I, I do not like raw broccoli nearly as much as I do like it cooked. But yeah, when I was a kid, I didn't really like it either way. Do you think there's something to that? Is there like a listen to your body's logic where maybe kids shouldn't be forced to eat things they really find obnoxious? It does make some intuitive sense to me, but I'd love to hear your thoughts. My guess is is that the answer is no that that is to say that eating broccoli or some of these other plant stuffs will not have an adverse effect on children and so if we give kids a choice you know we have five different things on their plate they tend to gravitate towards the non-bitter tasting food right because they have a choice but i'm thinking you know in human evolution our ancestors didn't always have a choice and yeah. they had to feed their kids something although interestingly they probably feed their kids milk, breast milk, longer than we do now. Yeah. We're, we're getting way off on some interesting ideas, but yeah, I, I don't know how much of these chemicals are in the breast milk, but in theory, it should be similar to blood. If the mom is eating these bitter tasting and things, they, the chemicals should get into the breast milk. And that should apply right. even women nowadays, you know, say vegetarians. To my knowledge, their kids don't have any worse outcomes than non-vegetarians. And they're very likely the kids through the breast milk are getting these chemicals. Smart Drug Smarts. So thank you so very much to Dr. Mark Matson for taking the time for that conversation. We covered everything from caffeine to asparagus to selenium to breast milk. And a good reminder of that saying that I hear doctors bandy about sometimes, which is that the dose makes the medicine, which I also sometimes hear said as the dose makes the poison. And they're both true. I mean, they're two sides of the same coin. I'm not sure which of those two is actually the official quote, but I've heard it both ways enough times that at this point, that's kind of the point. I suspect that Dr. Mark Matson might not realize just kind of how influential he is. Maybe he knows, but he's one of those names that when I talk with people about about health stuff, everybody seems to cite something that they saw or read or came to them by way of Dr. Matson. His work is actually very, very influential. I suspect that the massive rise of intermittent fasting as a lifestyle for a lot of people over the course of the last couple of years, Dr. Matson's work has a lot to do with promulgating that. He's somebody that we will definitely continue to keep an eye on and hope to hear from more in the future. But now, as promised, let's switch gears to the ruthless listener retention gimmick. Smart Drug Smarts, ruthless listener retention gimmick. Not knowing how to rest properly sounds a little like not knowing how to make gravity work. It just seems like one of these things that should be obvious and automatic. But it turns out that's not the case. There has been a lot of study by institutions from South Korea to Germany to the Pacific Northwest looking at how busy professionals trying to get a lot done can effectively take micro breaks throughout the day and avoid worsening performance from fatigue or just feeling crappy from fatigue, both of which go hand in hand. The findings in some ways are a little bit obvious, but it's also obvious in the sense that a lot of them are a forehead slapper because it's not the way that we typically operate. Probably the number one thing that people do incorrectly, according to the science, when they take breaks during the workday, is that the breaks are not really breaks. And I, I'm certainly guilty of this myself. An alarm ends or you finish a project and you figure, okay, I'm going to take a little bit of a break. But instead of really shutting down, you just switch tasks to something that seems like, you know, maybe it's going to be a little bit more fun. You read an article or you answer an email to a friend or something like that. Activities that still involve willpower and concentration, just not in the work context. And these types of activities, counterintuitive though it may be, they just add to your fatigue levels. A study conducted at George Mason University looked at the things that various office workers did during their break time and then correlated that information against how fatigued they felt by the end of their workday. They coded the work break activities into relaxation, things like daydreaming or stretching, nutrition based, like grabbing a coffee or a donut, socializing, like chatting with colleagues, or cognitive, like reading a newspaper or checking email. And there was a clear division in the results. Only the relaxation and social break activities had any benefit. Nutrition based breaks were essentially neutral, and cognitive activities made things worse. It was basically just like they'd continue 
continued working. And an interesting study in South Korea showed that workers who during their lunch break would use their smartphones as opposed to chatting with friends in person, they felt like they'd enjoyed as much distraction from work as people who were socializing. But when they rated their level of exhaustion in the afternoon, that turned out not to be the case. So just just because you feel like you're getting a break does not really mean from a physiological perspective that you are, which is a little bit annoying. Research also suggests that it is good to take breaks early and often. Even if you're not tired yet, interspersing some micro breaks early in the day is actually shown to have more benefits than an equally restful period later in the day. Now, if you deprive yourself of breaks for a long time, when you finally do take one, in order to get any benefit, you need to take a longer break. So at some point, you do have to pay the piper. But if you do take frequent breaks, then just a couple of minutes can be enough to get benefits. Finally, research suggests that getting out of your work environment during your break, whether that's leaving your office or actually getting out of the building and taking a walk around the block, that can be really beneficial as well. If you work in an environment with any nature that you can expose yourself to reasonably close, trees and birds and running water, things like that, have been shown time and time again to have lots of cognitive benefits. So we are just minutes away from the end of this podcast episode. I highly encourage you to give yourself a five or a ten minute break. Do a whole lot of nothing as you hear the music come up at the end. Just say no to dr... Ah, scratch that. Say yes to the Smart Drug Smarts podcast. Join our mailing list at www.smartdrugsmarts.com. Okay, so you heard it. That is the entire episode number 150 now coming in for a landing. Thank you for hanging around until the very end. If you enjoyed this episode and you want to point some friends in this direction, you will find all the links to everything that we discussed here online at smartdrugsmarts.com slash 150. Last week in episode number 149, we talked about the plant kava and particularly the extract of the kava root, which depending on the dose can be either a therapeutic medicine or a recreational drug. Next week, I think we're going to be talking about white noise and its effects on the brain. And in fact, other colors of noise as well. Well, strange to think of noise as being colored, but I guess they needed some sort of way of categorizing these random sounds, and that's what they wound up using. In a couple weeks from now, on October 28th, we'll be publishing our Halloween edition, which I'm very excited about. It's not necessarily going to be ghosts and goblins and things like that, but we've tried to find something both brain-relevant and scary. That is all for now. Catch you back here next week, same time, same podcast, and with the same unflagging commitment to helping you fine-tune the performance of your own brain. Have a great week, and stay smart. You've been listening to the Smart Drug Smarts podcast. Visit us online at www.smartdrugsmarts.com and subscribe to our mailing list to keep your neurons buzzing with the latest in brain optimization. Smart Drug Smarts should be listened to for entertainment purposes only. Although some guests on the show are medical doctors, most are not. And the host is just some random guy. Nothing you hear on this podcast or read at smartdrugsmarts.com should be considered medical advice. Consult your doctor and use some damn common sense before doing anything you think might have a lasting impact on your brain.